Let me invite you once again to take your Bible and open it to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. We're going to revisit the topic we talked about last night, or last week rather, and uh, talk about some additional things regarding legalism. You know, God does not want you to be a legalist. It's a term that's thrown around. Sometimes people understand what it means, sometimes they don't. Uh, but legalism is not walking in Christ. It's not walking in newness of life. It's actually walking in the oldness of the letter. It's walking in the flesh. And the flesh profits nothing. You know, if you had a, some study Bibles, if you look at Colossians chapter 2, uh, 11 through 17, sometimes the heading uh, in a study Bible would read, Christianity is exalted over legalism. And it's a good description of what God is seeking to communicate through this epistle that Paul wrote to uh, us as his children. Why is Christianity, however, exalted over legalism? You know, there's always been two great errors that have occurred in the church which are at opposite extremes in each other of each other. One is legalism and the other is licentiousness. You know, legalism is a condemning approach to Christianity. Uh, it's very harsh and very rigid and very rule oriented and then on the other end you have license which is kind of a free for all. Uh, and there's both extremes are wrong. One puts all sorts of restrictions on one's conduct, and the other takes them all away, if you will. And yet they both ignore Christ, and that's one of the flaws. They're ignoring who we are in Christ and what we possess in Christ. Legalism focuses on performance, and it's merit-based. And there's countless religious groups that are legalistic in their approach to God, approach to salvation. A lot of them teach salvation by works, or they try to mix works with faith. Some will tell you to believe and keep the law of Moses. If you go to certain Seventh-day Adventist churches, that is the message that you will hear. Some are believing to be circumcised. Some are believing to get water baptized. Some are believing to confess your sins. Some are believing to give up your bad habits and then fully surrender to the Lord, whatever that means. Some are believing to make a public display or have great sorrow or a great show of tears. Some is believe and then join the church. And these are real, I'm not making them up. But the response to the gospel is believe in Jesus Christ plus nothing else. Because Christ is the Savior, Christ is the one who saves. The issue is accepting him and him alone and what he's done. But the same mindset of believing plus can take place in the mind of the believer in Christ. And, uh, and you could have a works-oriented Christian life as well. You know, living morally doesn't make you a Christian any more than you meowing at the moon makes you a cat. It's not what you do that makes you a Christian. And for many, the means of this Christian life is performance-based. They try to keep a law as a means to godliness. And then at the other end, you have this licentiousness that rejects the law. In fact, both were actually part somewhat of this church that Paul is addressing here because the Gnostics were coming in and they, that whole mindset of theirs increased to lawlessness because they had this idea that material equals evil. Anything material is evil. And so since it's evil, it really doesn't matter what you did physically. They only viewed Christianity, if you will, from a spiritual standpoint. What you did in, in your body was inconsequential, completely out of balance. And so those who think that way have been known to say that my relationship with the Lord is great, even though they're drunk. I've never had a great relationship with the Lord. It's going really well. No. You know, and some of this was on display in the Corinthian church. Some within the church 
grasp the idea that grace means since I'm totally accepted in Christ and nothing can separate me from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus, they lived like nothing mattered. Now, let's be clear, how you live your life has zero bearing on one's eternal destiny. It has nothing to do with it. The eternal destiny of anybody is in no way, shape, or form related to their behavior. And yet that's often a thought that runs through people's mind. You know, Nicodemus, who was the, the religious, most, one of the most religious people ever to come in contact with Jesus, he was considered the teacher in Israel. What did Jesus say to him? He said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Didn't make how he lived his life the issue at all. The issue was, does he have life, spiritual life, in Christ? He didn't say, unless you turn over a new leaf and clean yourself up, or make me Lord of your, Lord of your life, or repent from your sins, or cry crocodile tears, or whatever it is. He said, if you're not born again, you don't go. See, eternal life is not for those who behave well. It's for those who trust in Christ alone and receive the offer of eternal life as a gift by faith alone in him. And so legalism does not equal the Christian life because Christ is your life. And so the issue in living the Christian life is, am I allowing Christ to live his life in me and through me? And if I'm focusing on Christ, that's much easier to grasp. If I'm focusing on externals, that becomes a problem. And so legalism doesn't equal the Christ life, nor does license. But since you have a volition, you can abuse the grace of God. And each one here has abused the grace of God. But notice how it was affecting the Corinthians. Paul here in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 says this. It's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality is not even named among the Gentiles, that a man should have his father's wife. And you're puffed up. It's like, hey, we believe in grace here, man. Just let her go. Paul says, no, you should be mourning. This is a total abuse of the grace of God. And he who has done this deed should be taken away from you. See, the error of the Corinthians, at least in this way, is found today. Many doing what they feel like doing, claiming they have liberty in Christ to do whatever they want. And what's really bad is in some cases, some are claiming that they're following the leading of the Holy Spirit when they do it. You know, I, over the years I've heard people claim the Holy Spirit's leading as they try to justify their sinful behavior. You know, that's impossible. The Holy Spirit does not lead people to violate the commands of Scripture, the principles and the precepts of His Word. I mean, if the Holy Spirit authored the Word of God, and he did, how could he then contradict himself to lead you to think and therefore function in a way that contradicts something he's written down? Does that make any sense at all? How could he lead you to violate something he wrote? I mean, Jesus, in trying to deal with the Pharisees, said a kingdom, and using the example of Satan, a kingdom divided itself cannot stand. So how can God be at odds with God, God the Father is at odds with God the Holy Spirit, that, that's impossible. And so you can rest assured that the Holy Spirit will never lead you to violate a established principle of the Word of God. He's not going to lead you into idolatry or homosexuality or theft or coveting or greed or materialism or drunkenness or lying or and then the opposite. He's not going to lead into, lead you into self-righteous pride. That's not going to come from him. And so Paul, and even dealing with the Corinthians, had to explain that their thinking was off. And he made it very clear that sexual morality is wrong. In 1 Corinthians 6, verses 18 through 20, he says, flee from sexual morality. Notice he calls it a Sin. So how is the Holy Spirit going to lead you into sin? Every other sin a man commits is outside the body, but sexual moral, sexually immoral person sins against his own body. And so sexual morality is a sin. I don't know how you dance around this. Do you know your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is within you, whom you have from God, and notice you're not your own. You're bought with a price, the highest price paid 
for your soul, the Lord Jesus Christ dying in your place. And so now the goal is to glorify God in your body because you belong to him, not use it in a way. And so this whole idea that your body is sinful is wrong and that you, know, you can use it any way you want, it's not going to affect you spiritually, totally flies in the face of scripture. And so it's important to recognize that. But the answer to avoiding both license and legalism is love. If I'm having a love affair with Christ and that's governing my thought process, I'm not going to have to worry about legalism. I'm not going to have to worry about license. I mean, if I think and meditate that God demonstrated his own love for me, that when I was still a sinner, Christ died for us. All these other things become, they go away. I mean, think about it. If I'm walking in love, and we're told in Ephesians chapter 5 to walk in love as a dear child of God, do you see anything about legalism here? Do you see anything about license? Love suffers long. Love is kind. Love doesn't envy. Love doesn't parade itself. It's not puffed up. It doesn't behave ruinedly. It doesn't seek its own. And if I'm being legalistic, I'm seeking my own. If I'm being licentious, I'm seeking my own. So that's not coming from the Spirit of God because the fruit of the Spirit is love. It's not provoked. It doesn't think any evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and goes on to say love never fails. So again, if I'm walking in love, I'm not going to be thrown into the ditch of legalism, and I'm not going to be thrown into the ditch of license. The Spirit of God within me is going to take my thinking and point me toward the Word of God so that I walk in newness of life in Christ. And so the answer really is love. You know, to falsely claim to You know, both legalism and license, and they're not called that necessarily, but the essence of what those things are, falsely claim that they're expressions of true spirituality, but both of them are poor substitutes of what your life in Christ really is. And that's important. I mean, if, if I'm loving you, I'm not going to be judging or condemning you for your failure to meet my, extern my external standard. And at the other side of the equation, I'm not going to try and take advantage of you by encouraging you to just let it rip in a licentious way. Love doesn't do those things. It's not condemning in a legalistic way, and it's not encouraging looseness on the other end of it. Those are both imbalances. This is why we're told that without Christ we can do nothing. The legalist, however, thinks that God is impressed with his efforts. And the licensed way of thinking says, God doesn't care what I do. And both are wrong. See, the best you have to offer in your flesh is unacceptable to God. I don't care if it's moral, externally, or anything else you want to do. Your flesh profits nothing. Nothing within you can produce anything that God's going to say, oh, that was really something. He's not going to be impressed at all. How many people prior to salvation try to be morally pure? Does that help them get any closer to God? No, it's a filthy rag. It doesn't help at all. And so my moral purity and trying to produce it from my own flesh doesn't get me any closer to God even as his child. You live the Christian life the same way you get saved. You allow God to work in you and through you so as you're spiritual, you'll by default be moral. It's a byproduct of walking with him. You don't get moral to enjoy God's relationship, your relationship with God. You enjoy him and he takes care of the morality. Sometimes you put the cart before the horse. And so Paul here is trying to make it clear that the message of Colossians is that Jesus Christ is superior 
to any other human philosophy that you think you might have going for you. And this is why, again, in verse 9, what does it say? It says, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you're complete in him. God is both, Jesus is both fully God, fully man. He's superior in every way. Walking with Christ is superior because you are filled to the full with him. All the spiritual resources you need to walk in newness of life have been freely given to you in Christ. Everything we need to walk godly is through his divine power, which we have through Christ. We read here in verse 11, that, or verse 10, that he's the head of all principality and power, which means he's got a superior position than angels and what have you. He provides a circumcision which is superior than the one made with hands given to Abraham because this is a spiritual circumcision. You have a superior baptism because now you're identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection, so you can walk in newness of life. You're superior, Christ is superior because he's made you alive together with him, according to verse 13. He's forgiven you all trespasses. Christ has appeared because he's wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, was contrary to us. Notice, he is taken out of the way. He nailed it to his cross. This is what Christ has done for us. And he's superior to Satan and his angels. He triumphed over them, exposed them, and condemned them. And so why do you need something else? Why do you need some rules to follow to help you live a Christian life. The Christian life, by definition, is Christ living his life in you and through you. And the grace of God should thrill you and encourage you to that end. And this is what a lot of people miss, though they're well-meaning. I mean, consider your salvation from sin's penalty. We've seen countless times, if you've been part of this church, that the Mosaic law cannot justify you in any way, shape, or form. It's designed to show how holy God is, and it's designed to show you how sinful you are. That's the purpose of the law. You've broken his holy righteous standard. Notice it's designed that every mouth, that includes yours and mine, may be stopped or closed, okay, and that all the world may become guilty before God. So the purpose of the law, the Mosaic law, is God's holy righteous standard, is to get you to just close your mouth. You know, it's helpful to understand the difference between the moral law of God and the Mosaic law. The moral law of God is eternal. The Mosaic law was written by Moses, but Cain killed Abel. So it was all of a sudden, when Cain murdered Abel, was that not wrong because it wasn't written down on Mosaic law? No, it was wrong. It was wrong from the get-go. It's always been wrong to murder. It was always wrong, even before it was written down in the Decalogue, that you should not murder somebody. And back then, their conscience told them it was wrong. This is why, again, these missionaries that go into a very based tribes in the jungle, once they can communicate with them, they all recognize that murdering another man was wrong. The Decalogue wasn't posted on a tree out in the jungle. They had a conscience that told them it was wrong, just like they all told it was wrong for stealing. They knew it was wrong. It's written on the conscience of mankind that condemns them. And you see the word guilty there carries the idea of not only guilty, but it's the Greek word. I'm going to write it down here. Hupo, hupo dikos. And the word carries the idea of not only guilt, but also liable to pay. So the law had this function to not only show you were guilty, but also remind you that you're liable to pay because you are guilty. And it, you know, it shuts your mouth. When it says, thou shalt not lie, I should go, mm, I'm a liar. Thou shalt not covet, mm, I wanted that 
whatever it was that someone else had. Mm. Right? When it says, thou shalt not use the Lord's name in vain. Ooh, it blew that one too. And on and on we could go. But not only the law, that's why the law was a ministry of condemnation. It's a ministry of death. It declares you guilty, but it also reminds you that you're liable to pay for your guilt. You're sentenced under the penalty of law. You must pay. I mean, last Wednesday night after the message, I had a discussion with a lady that said the Ten Commandments were designed to show us how God wants us to live. And I said, well, they expressed his holy righteous standard, but I said, all it does is show us that we've broken the standard. And I proceeded to convince her that she has sinned some 500,000 times, probably, even though she's not even 30 years old yet. Because of that very thing she said it was designed to show her what to do, I said, all it did was condemn you. Because I know you've lied, even though you've meant well. You've coveted, you've stolen, you've lusted, you've broken them all. And so, because we're guilty, we're liable to pay, and the wages of sin is death. In fact, what the law designed God to do was make sin exceedingly sinful. Romans 5.20 says this, the law came in so that the transgression would increase, but where sin increased, thankfully, the grace abounded all the more. See, law becomes more, we become more sensitive to it and more pronounced when we see it written in front of us as you break it. That's why you might be driving 85, but all of a sudden it hits you when your sign says 60 and you go by at 85, that law just condemned you in a way that it didn't condemn you prior to that. It's Romans 7, 7, 13 says the law makes sin exceedingly sinful. And so when you view the standard, you recognize how far short you've fallen. And so that's why we saw last time that Galatians 3 says the law was a curse to everyone who didn't keep it completely. And we've all broken it, so we're all cursed, and yet Jesus Christ became a curse for us. It says in that verse, I should have brought up here, to redeem us or to buy us out of the slave market of sin, to pay the penalty we deserve to pay. This is why 2 Corinthians 5.20 tells us, God made him who knew no sin. He had zero sin to be sin for, and the word for there means in our place so that we in him might be become the righteousness we need to get to heaven, the righteousness of God, which is put to our account the very moment we place our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he wanted to do. So someone had to pay, God in his love said, I'll pay that, and Christ willingly did that. He willingly became a curse for you and for me to that end. But everyone's gotta to choose to believe it. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me. In other words, Christ said, God's Father gave a stamp of approval on the Lord Jesus Christ, said, this is my son who I'm well pleased. This is the Messiah. When you make a choice to put 100% of your trust in him, you have right now eternal life, and you won't be judged in the future because you've crossed over, and in the Greek, that's in the perfect tense, which means you once and for all cross over from the realm of death to the realm of life. This is all free to you and me. It's the good news of the gospel. And so the only part the law had in your salvation was not your spiritual batting average, but to show you your failure so you would be driven to Christ and trust him and him alone. And you see, the law has no part in your sanctification. First of all, because if you're saved here this morning, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Because... The very thing that condemned you was nailed to the cross. All the charges against you have been paid for, so there's nothing left. Therefore, there's no condemnation. But Galatians shows the law has no place in your sanctification. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by the works of the law? The answer was no. It wasn't your law keeping that God says, you know what, you batted 300 this week. You get the Spirit of God. No, it was the hearing of the message of faith, faith in Christ. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, the Spirit regenerated you, you became born again, He took up residence within you, that's how you began your Christian life. 
Are you now completed or brought to maturity in the flesh? The law always appealed to your flesh to perform. And his message to these Galatians was, are you now going to perform the Christian life in order to be sanctified? And the answer is no. And so the principle that the law cannot save you from sin's penalty is equally true in the Christian life. The law cannot save you from sin's power. It could not do nothing for you in making you righteous prior to salvation. It can do nothing for you in making you righteous as God's child. That's not what it's designed to do. It was your schoolmaster to bring you to Christ, and after it's done its job, it's no longer needed. That's how this design is. This is why it's so important to know who you are in Christ. And so the command here in verse 16 of chapter 2 is let no one judge you in food or in drink regarding a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substances of Christ. So this is a warning to beware of legalism. He warned us in verse 4 about those with enticing words. He says, this I say, anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. He warned you in verse 8, he warned me, beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. And now he's warning you about legalism through the, a command. And he's saying here the foundation for living the Christian life is your position in Christ. It's not law keeping. He wants you to reckon upon the facts that are true of you as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you reckon upon these things, you won't be legalist in your thinking because the focus of all these things is Christ. Verses 9 through 15 tell you all about what Christ did for you. The issue in the Christian life is resting in the resources that are mine in Christ. And so the question on your handout is, do you reckon upon the following, that you are complete in Christ? Do you stop and say, you know what, Lord, thanks. I've got all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Thank you very much. Do you recognize that I've been spiritually circumcised in Christ? I have been cut off from the power of the sin nature in my life. I no longer have to yield to its orders. I don't have to listen to it. I don't have to follow it. Its authority has been stripped away in my life. Do you recognize that you have been co-buried and co-raised with Christ, that you've been identified with him? So you, according to Romans 6, I can now walk in newness of life. Do I reckon upon that fact? If you don't think about these things, they can't affect you. Do you recognize upon the fact that you've been forgiven all trespasses, and now because of that, you're alive unto God. You're alive with Christ, seated in the heavenlies. Do you reckon upon that as fact? Do you reckon upon that you've been delivered from the bondage of the law, and the law has been wiped out and nailed to the cross, it can no longer condemn you? And do you reckon upon the fact that you've been freed from the tyranny of Satan? Satan author Satan's authority has been stripped as well. You can now withstand the evil darts that he throws at you with the shield of faith because his power has been broken and you're in Christ and therefore you can stand in him. See, the command of verse 16 is in essence asking you the question, if you're complete in Christ and your enemies, which are the world, your flesh, and the devil, have been defeated through the victory that he secured on the cross, why do you try to seek spiritual victory in the very things that Christ defeated on the cross? Does that make any sense at all? These things can never deliver the goods in the first place, so why are you going back to the, as Galatians says, the weak and beggarly things that can't deliver you? Why do you think rules and regulations are going to deliver you? Why are you trying to embrace some philosophy? I mean, if the law, again, if the law could not do anything for you spiritually prior to salvation, why do you think it can help you after you're saved? So Paul's command to resist legalism is stated, let no man judge you. 
This is a prohibition against legalistic judging. Now, you could be the one doing the judging, or someone else could be doing the one, the judging to you. You see, after the thinking of legalistic, legalistic thinking is a mindset that condemns others. There's a mindset of condemnation there. It's a mindset of condemnation. Either you're on the receiving end of it or you're the one delivering it. And the word judge there is a Greek or Korean. It means to pronounce judgment on something in a condemning way. It's a personal judgment on someone's action to wrongly criticize or condemn them. It's, it's the fault-finding kind of judging. You know, if I've got a mindset of fault-finding, I'm never not going to be unsuccessful. If I'm looking at your life thinking, well, can I find something wrong with your life? Do you think I'm going to be successful? Uh, no kidding. No one here walks on water, unless it's the middle of January. No, it's that mindset. You know, if you're on a fault-finding mission, at least in your own mind, you're going to find what you're looking for. And it's interesting, when that's my posture, if I've got this fault-finding posture, when the Word of God is spoken, instead of saying, Lord, what do you have for me here? I'm going to say, boy, I hope so-and-so is listening over there. Oh, boy, do they need this one. The Bible says, take heed to yourself. You're going to be the evaluator. And you're going to ignore when the Spirit of God wants to take the Word of God and point out something in your life, you're going to be thinking, no, 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 no. Boy, I'm sure glad she's here tonight, though. Oh, 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 oh. But, you know, you can get it from both sides. These self-righteous legalists will condemn you for your failure to perform to their level or standard, whatever it is. And they either directly or indirectly put pressure on you to perform. It might be very subtle. It might be in your face. Who knows? It might be verbally. It might be non-verbally. They might, you know, not like the way you dress or the way you have your hair or the way you're wearing your makeup, and they might just send a message like, or whatever it is, blah, 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 I don't like, you know, or it could be what you're eating, what you're drinking, whatever. I mean, it's Mickey Mouse is what it is. It's always externals. You know, if I'm having a love affair with Christ, I'm going to realize that isn't even the issue. I'm going to say, you know what, Lord, i got so many issues, I don't have time to fix their issues. And the whole point of sanctification is you get sanctified the same way you get saved. The Spirit of God brought me to Christ, saved me from sin's penalty, and the Holy Spirit working in me is going to take the Word of God, show me where it fits in my life, and then He'll set me apart as I have a love affair with Him and walk by faith. That's what it is. He's the one that's got to do it. He had to save me from sin's penalty. He's got to be the one to save me from sin's power. Because I might even have some level of success and not stealing from my neighbor, but then I can get proud of it. I haven't stolen in weeks. If I'm having a love affair with Christ, I don't have to worry about stealing your stuff. Because Christ isn't going to direct me to steal. It's not going to be, oh, I can't steal, are you? Start vibrating. You know, James brings this out. He says, don't speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of law and judges law. In other words, you think you're something, you're nothing, and you're at a fault-finding mission. If you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law. Your concern is, is my own nose clean? Not judging if your nose is clean. There's one lawgiver who is able to save and destroy. Who are you to judge another? And so God doesn't want us to be critical individuals. Having this mental posture of critical evaluation. And when you've got that, I know that by default, I don't, I've never, won, never met anyone who's, who's a critical evaluator that isn't a whiner. Because they find fault with everything, except themselves. And they blame others for their problems. And they excuse themselves. They're the excuse, they've got, they're the exception to every rule under the sun, for some reason. 
They're never honest with their own failures. And in most cases, they'd rather die than admit they're wrong. And you see, all those things are indicators that you've lost sight of the grace of God. But I get up in the morning and say, you know what, Lord, it's by the grace of God I can put one foot in front of the other. My whole mindset is different. And it's only by the grace of God you can put one foot in front of the other. That's the posture that helps you to lovingly come alongside and help someone. That's what even Galatians 1 has said. If someone is overtaken of fault, you who are spiritual, come alongside and help them. It's easy to stand back and say, boy, that guy is a loser in the first order. It's interesting, though, you can actually feel pressure, though, from those who want to live loosely and want you to join them. It's kind of a reverse kind of legalism. And I've seen this as well. You actually feel pressure to give approval to those that are doing things they know they shouldn't be doing. You know, you... I mean, there's been times, this is true, when I, shortly after I got saved, I run into my old buddies and they say, hey, Sean, why don't you come out with us tonight? I go, no, oh, come on, man, it ain't gonna hurt. And they try to bring me down. And I never tried to take this self-righteous with you guys, uh, no. But there was always pressure to join them. And they try to condemn you as someone who's self-righteous. Even hanging out with believers sometimes, I was shortly after I was saved, We'd hang out, we'd have some time, and then they were going to go do something, like go see a movie that I didn't think the Lord wanted me to watch. And I said, you know what, you guys go do what you want. I'm not going to do it. Oh, come on, man. It's like they wanted to include me to not feel guilty about what they were doing. They were already condemned in their own mind. In their own mind, they, they already knew they shouldn't have been doing it, but they wanted to bring me in on it. That's a reverse kind of legalism. I've heard of people that go over to their relatives around Christmas time, and relatives are doing what relatives do, and they say, oh, well, oh, I guess you're too good for us. Reverse kind of pressure to get you to lower or ignore your conviction. Now, you're not self-righteous about it. I just simply say, hey, no thanks. You do your thing. That's your thing. You don't have to be self-righteous, you know, but you can say, you know what, before the Lord, I don't think he wants me to do that, thank you. So you can get, you can get it from all sides. You can get it from all sides. This is why if I'm having a love affair with Christ, I don't have to worry about it. Even though I feel pressure to conform to something, because legalism always puts the pressure on you to conform to something. It might be negative, it might be positive. If I'm having a love affair with Christ, I can just say, you know what? I'm being who God would have to be for his glory. I'm not here to condemn you. One way or another, I'm here to be who God would have me to be. End of story. Now, in this culture, the issue was food and drink. You know, if you're really spiritual, you wouldn't be eating that crap. You know? I can't believe you drink, you know, 16 Cokes a day. It's none of your business. That's my problem. Or observing a festival, no one's in Sabbath. There was a religious Thing. But you know, in each one of these things, what, notice what's going on here. There's an external evaluation. I'm watching what you're eating. I'm watching what you're drinking. I'm watching if you're partaking in something. What am I watching you for? I should be watching Christ. These things are external. Notice, the issue from God's perspective is what's going on in my heart. That's where God's looking at the heart. But when I've got a legalistic mindset, my externals, my either partaking or not partaking of the taboos, whatever they are, is how I'm going to evaluate whether I'm walking with the Lord or not. And younger believers can get caught up in imitating older believers thinking, well, if they're spiritual, they're, they don't do this, this, and this, that's what I'm going to do. Missing the point. Sometimes people look at others and say, well, my sins aren't as bad as yours, so I must be doing okay. What? You know, sometimes people think, well, I'm spiritual because I'm faithful in praying and giving and witnessing and attending church and so forth. 
Well, can an unbeliever pray, give, go to church? Does that make them spiritual? It's not what you're doing that makes you spiritual. They're not the means to spirituality. They're to be the byproduct. Since I'm having a love affair with Christ, it's my privilege to pray. Since I'm having a love affair with Christ, it's my privilege to read my Bible. Unbelievers read their Bible. Does that make them spiritual? No. And some people got this checklist. Well, I read my Bible. I prayed. I, you know, I walked the dog or whatever. I mean, who here has prayed and thought about the Vikings or something as they were praying? I mean, you could be a million miles away. You could do it. I've read my Bible, and then 10 minutes later, I said, where have I been? Anyone else succumb to that? I mean, it's not the means. I need to be having a love affair with Christ to make those other things effective. If I'm having a love affair with Christ, I can give this honor to the Lord. It's not, well, I gave five bucks this week. But I must be doing pretty good spiritually. No, I'm having a love affair with Christ. It's my privilege to give. Your Lord, take it all. The amount is not the issue. The issue is the thinking. The issue is, wow, I'm having a love affair with Christ. That's true Christianity. So if I'm in fellowship with the Lord and I'm occupied with Christ and I'm controlled by the Spirit of God, He can then direct me in a way that whatever my activities are, they can be honorable to him, not the other way around. So important to recognize. But if I've got a legalistic bent, I'm gonna have to, I'm not gonna feel good unless I got my, my list checked off. That's why Christianity is Christ. Now they would say, well, yeah, of course you need Christ, but you know what? You're not observing the days properly. So it's Christ plus observing the days properly. Yeah, it's Christ, but you gotta be eating the right food or eating the right way or whatever other nonsense you got going on. You know, you can't be shoveling snow on the Sabbath. Boy, do I wish that was true. <laughs> The reason these legalistic observances are to be rejected is because they're only a picture of the reality. They're focusing on these things that were designed to picture Christ. Notice verse 17, what does he call them? They're a shadow of things to come, a shadow. A shadow pictures a reality, but the shadow isn't the reality. If I've got a light behind me, I ain't gonna project a shadow onto the ground, but the shadow is not me. It's just an indicator of me. That's the difference. In fact, the writer of Hebrews had to bring this out. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come. In other words, they predicted Christ. And not the very image of the things. They weren't Christ, but they were a picture of Christ. Can never with these same sacrifices, which they offer continually year by year, make those who approach perfect. They were just pictures. For then would they have not ceased to be offered. For the worshipers, once purified, would have no more consciousness of sins. They brought sacrifices year after year after year, and it didn't do a thing. They had to keep doing it because, but once the Lamb of God came and took away the sin of the world, the reality was there. And those things that they pictured are no longer needed. And that's what rules and regulations are. They're pictures. See, for... For the believer, the reality is Christ. You know, I used this before, but morality is a picture. I can seek to be moral, but that doesn't mean I'm walking with the Lord. But if I'm walking with the Lord, I'm going to be moral. One puts the cart before the horse. If I'm seeking to live in according to the law, I'm going to be worried all the time if I'm doing it right or not. There's pressure there. And I'm running the risk of condemnation because I didn't eat the right thing today or whatever it might be. The whole focus is wrong. It's not Christ, it's my performance. You live the Christian life the same way you get saved. I trusted Christ to do something for me. 
that I couldn't do for myself. That's what I did when I got saved. That's how I moment by moment lived the Christian life, trusting him to work in me and through me. Because in my flesh dwells no good thing. I'm accepted and a beloved one. As soon as I start legalistically, I'm in self-condemnation because I blew it again. It's the demerit principle. This is why Paul said the love of Christ constrains me, not the potential chewing out by Christ constrains me. No, it's the love of Christ that constrains me. The law is called, again, a ministry of condemnation and death because you can't operate in it with any kind of success. And so last time I told you the legalism, it's a, and this, I wanted to underscore this, it's, it's a way of thinking. It's not what you're doing, it's how you think about what you're doing. It's a mental attitude that seeks to earn something by what I'm doing. And this is either for salvation or for sanctification. It's how I think about what I'm doing. The motivation behind what I'm doing. It's not having standard, it's how I approach these things. See, sometimes the way something's done is viewed as divine law. If we're not doing it just the right way, well then God is unacceptable. And God says, I'm looking at your heart. I'm not looking at your performance. And I want you to do it, and I want you to allow me to work in you and through you so that what is done honors me, not Boy, did I cross my I, or cross my T perfectly and dot my I perfectly. It's a way of thinking. See, it's a way of thinking behind what does, what does that makes him a legalist. It's not the standard. God's standard has never changed, but if I think that I can meet that standard through my performance, then I'm a legalist. That's exactly what people think when they want to keep the law to get saved. Now, I mentioned these last time, but someone says, why don't you do it in a way that you can write them down? I said, all right, I'll do it this way. It's big on externals. See, if I'm thinking legalistically, my focus is horizontal. I'm evaluating everything externally when God's looking at the heart. It's what it looks like. It encourages pride. Did you see how good I did there? Thank you. I am good. Or it ends in despair. You know what? I can't do anything right. And it results in competition because it's performance-based. And I'm looking horizontally, and I'm trying to stack myself up against so-and-so and see how he's doing. And God says, you know what? The issue is you're going to answer to me. Why aren't you concerned about looking to me? So instead of responding to the Lord, I'm comparing myself with others. So that means I'm going to be critical. I'm either going to be critical to those who don't meet the standard that I've imposed upon them, or I'm going to be a victim of their criticalness because they're the legalist or whatever it is. The whole focus is wrong. That's why it leads to hypocrisy. Because no one ever consistently lives up to their own standard. No one ever does. So eventually, you have to become a phony. You've got to keep up a front. Tremendous pressure to do that. And again, you end up holding someone to a standard that you can't keep yourself, or you're one way at church in front of everyone, and then you're another way on the job or, or somewhere else. And here's, here's the, the deceiving part of it, is you can look really good on the outside, and on the inside you can have all kinds of mental attitude sins. As you run someone into the ground, I hope they die. Oh, hey, how are you today? Oh, Lord. <laughs> Externally, everything's just hunky-dory, and inside you're thinking. <laughs> this is why it's contrary to grace. Grace means, you know what, it's, again, it's amazing that God bothers with me, and it's only by his grace that I haven't screwed it up worse than I already have. And it's big on non-biblical tradition. You know, I chanced to witness to someone today, and I said, well, how do you know you're saved? He said, well, I asked Jesus in my heart. You know what that is? That's a non-biblical tradition right there. I said, what'd you do that for? 
Didn't know what to say. Didn't know what to say. And it ends up garbling the one true response to the gospel. They did it because that's what they were told to do. And you don't have to have any understanding of who Christ is or what he did for you on the cross to ask him into your heart. No, it requires none of those things. You know, some churches are really sticklers. You know, we've got to have the Lord's Supper every week. Some churches are like that. Word of God says, Paul says, as often as you do it, you can do it as, many, as often as you want. It doesn't matter. But then you have the King James only churches. I don't even know what to say there. I mean, can you actually, can someone get saved reading an NIV Bible? You know what? They could get saved reading an NIV Bible. Someone's head explodes because they're King James only. You know, some people, some believers like legalism. You know why? They just want to say, just tell me what to do. Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. They don't want to use their brain. They say, just tell me what to do. They want a mathematical formula to follow. You know, it's, again, it's my checklist. I read my Bible, I prayed, I walked the dog, I did the dishes. I, you know, I, life is grand. No, 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 no. Christianity is a living relationship with the living God of the universe. And you can enjoy Jesus Christ, and the house could look like a tornado went through it, and you could be in perfect fellowship with God. Imagine that. Otherwise, I'd never be in fellowship. No, I'm just kidding. You know, even a dead clock is right twice a day, right? I mean, any unsaved person can do these things, and they're not spiritual at all. And so this legalistic approach is just a, a, a burden, is all it ends up being, an absolute burden. And this is why it's so important to learn how to think lovingly and graciously and respond to the person of Jesus Christ. My goal in everything I do should be to please Jesus Christ and to see him exalted. And if I'm having a love affair with him, the details are gonna fall into place one way or another, right? Paul said, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He says, I am what I am by the grace of God. I wasn't trying to earn brownie points with God. And this is why legalism says, in effect, Jesus Christ is not sufficient. It's not sufficient. This is why when it comes to doing the will of God, the issue is, am I abiding in Christ? Christ said, I'm the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, not he who checks his list off, you know, spends time reading the Bible, praying, doesn't watch TV, whatever it might be. No, he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can't do anything. Externally, you can do everything perfect, and God says, sorry, pal, that means nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he's cast forth of the branch and withered. They, men gather them and they throw them in the fire and they're burned. In other words, that's a wasted life because I didn't abide. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, if I'm having a love affair with Christ, the byproduct is I'm going to pray. I'm going to ask what you desire. And it'll be done for you. And my Father's going to be glorified. And I'm going to bear much fruit. And life's going to be good. See, when I'm not walking with the Lord, I'm occupied with myself, and everything's chaos. And even if I do good things when I'm not walking with the Lord, when I stand before Christ, it's going to be wood, hay, and stubble because my motivation was, hey, did you see what a good job I did here? Thank you. It was, I really helped them and they loved me. You know, it should be instead of, you know what, I'm going to do this on the Lord. They might not even notice. They might not care. In fact, they might be critical of everything I'm doing. But since I'm doing it for Jesus Christ, he's going to say, oh, since he's empowering me to do it, he gets glorified. 
That's Christianity. You know, obedience in and of itself is not, to the word of God is not legalism, though it can be. The issue is what's motivating you and who are you depending upon? Are you allowing Christ to work in you and through you so it's done for his glory? You know, sometimes people say you need to obey to be spiritual. No, that's putting the cart before the horse. You need to be spiritual to obey. Obedience to the word of God is a byproduct of me having a love affair with Christ and allowing him to work in me and through me. Let's see, just one example of legalism. And then we'll call it a night. Go with me to Acts chapter 5. Notice the end of Acts 4, verse 36 says, And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated as son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land sold it, brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. No one forced him to do it. He was having a love affair with Christ. He bought some money and gave it to the church. He bought some, or sold some land, rather, gave it to the church. Verse, chapter 5, verse 1. A certain man named Ananias, with his Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And they kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, what's the difference externally between what they did and what Barnabas did? Nothing externally. They sold some land, laid some money. But notice the thinking behind it. They kept back part of it. They laid the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why you Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While the remain was it not your own? In other words, you had perfect liberty to do with it what you want. And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? You didn't have to give the money to anybody. Why have you conceived in this thing in your heart? You've lied not to men but to God. In other words, they were doing it to look good. They were doing it because someone else did it. Their heart wasn't in it. So they said, here, we sold the land and we're giving to the church, when deep down they're saying, you know what, I really don't want to do this. I guess I should because Barnabas did. We want to look good, so see what I'm saying here? It wasn't the external action at all. It was the heart. He didn't have to give a dime. You don't have to give a dime. Giving doesn't make you spiritual, but if you're having a love affair with Christ and he puts it on your heart, then you do it as unto him. Does that make sense? The legalist says, all right, I'll do it. Kicking and screaming the whole way. That's why we, you know, we take up an offering. We say, listen, if you can't do it willingly, it's honor to the Lord out of a thankful heart, keep it. Keep it. The issue in our Christian life is, am I having a love affair with Christ? And then we can rejoice and who he is and how he's working and what he's doing. And we can encourage one another in love to that end. That's what it's all about. See, the problem was not in what they gave. It was their attitude in giving. And that's what made the difference. And so Christianity is not what I'm doing. It's how I'm thinking. And am I allowing Christ to live and work in me and through me so that what is done is wrought of the Spirit of God and brings honor and glory to Him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace. We know that we are what we are by the grace of God. It's not what we do, it's who you are. It's how you work. And I pray with humble hearts we would allow you to work in our hearts, that we'd be yielded vessels in which you could use so that what is done glorifies the Lord Jesus Christ because it's wrought in him. Help us to understand these truths, to truly allow the Spirit of God to get a hold of us in our thinking so that what is done is done out of love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for him, what he's done for us, how he's given us a new position in Christ. 
and he's given us all things to pertain to life and godliness. And so may he work for his glory, and we give thanks and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for coming.